Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Global protest highlight and force disappearances in Pakistan. Surge in terror attacks as terrorists shift focus from Kashmir to Jammu. And Afghan women sing in defiance of Taliban laws, silencing their voices. August 30th marks the International Day of the Victims of Enforced Disappearances, a day dedicated to shedding light on the grim reality of enforced disappearances, a tactic often employed by states to silent dissent and instill fear. This year, the issue took center stage as protests were held across Europe by the Free Balochistan Movement and various human rights organizations, highlighting the ongoing crisis in Pakistan's regions, including Balochistan, Sindh and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. These protests underscored the dire human rights situation and the growing demand for global action. On August 30 every year, the United Nations observes the International Day for Enforced Disappearance all over the world. Enforced disappearances involve the arrest or abduction of a person by or on behalf of the state, followed by a refusal by the same authorities to acknowledge it. The move is used as a means to silence the opposition and spread terror. In London, the Free Balochistan Movement, a group advocating for Baloch independence, organized a protest outside the British Prime Minister's residence. Demonstrators carried banners, placards and photos of the disappeared, chanting against the severe human rights abuses in Balochistan. The protest attracted not only Baloch activists, but also British human rights advocates, all united in their call for justice for the victims of enforced disappearances. Um, I'm here today as a British person to speak up for my Baloch brothers and sisters, what they have been experiencing in Balochistan, where there have been enforced disappearances, where their family members get arrested and then they disappear and then they don't get seen again, or their mutilated bodies are found much later. We as British people we should be speaking up and we are calling on Keir Starmer, our Prime Minister, to speak against what the Pakistani authority are doing to the lot of people because it is a genocide. Meanwhile, in Amsterdam, the Free Balochistan Movement's Netherlands branch held a similar demonstration, drawing attention to the brutal practice of enforced disappearances perpetrated by Pakistani forces. These protests emphasize that enforced disappearances are a widespread issue, tarnishing Pakistan's human rights record. However, the issue is not isolated to Balochistan. Reports of enforced disappearances have surfaced across multiple regions in Pakistan, including Sindh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and parts of Punjab, where activists, journalists, human rights defenders, students and political opponents have been targeted. On this International Day, the GS Hind Freedom Movement made a powerful appeal to the international community, including the United Nations and Amnesty International, urging them to intervene and help recover missing persons from Sindh, Balochistan, Pashtun areas, Saraiki regions, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Kashmir. जिनके रियासती एजेंसियों घर या रोड हलंदे खंबे पांजे अकुबत खानन में वे जनतियों जिते के इन मुख्तलिफ टार्चरन के मून डेनों पावे थो उपतो लटकायन नक्क में चुन जो पाणी वे जन नह कड़न ओजागु करायन रियासती इदारा आजादी पसंद सिंधी कारकुनन के मारे मारे कदें जेनी तक कदें वरी जिस्मानी तोर मखलूच करे शदिन था तक कदें वरी इन्हन जालाश तो फो करे मोकलिया वंजन था एक अंदाजे मोजब सन 2002 खांवटी 2004 तय सिंधमा 5000 खांवटी के जीएसएनजे 
कारकुन के मिसिंग किया जी सरासर इंसानी हक की खिलाफ वर्जी है पाकिस्तान के बेन मजलूम कौम भी रियासती डाट जारी है बलोचन जहा बी हजार कौमी कारकुन जबरी तौर गुम क्या वह पश्तून जहा चार हजार मू गुम जदे त सरायकी गिलगिती कश्मीरी कौमी कारकुन भी वे अंग में रियासती इदार हथा गुम क्या वह इनफोर्स डिसअपियरेंस के आलमी दिहाड़े से जी एस एन फ्रीडम मूवमेंट अपील करे थी यूनाइटेड नेशंस एमनेस्टी इंटरनेशनल समेत आलमी जमीर के जबरी गुम कल सिंधी बलोच पश्तून सरायकी गिलगिती कश्मीरी कारकुन के पाकिस्तानी इदार बाजियाब कराए वे इनफोर्स डिसअपियरेंसेज रिमेन अ क्रिटिकल ह्यूमन राइट्स इशू इन पाकिस्तान विद न्यू केसेज कंटिन्यूअली कमिंग टू लाइट Despite the pledges of successive governments to criminalize the practices there has been a very slow movement on legislation which is equal to nothing while people continue to be forcibly disappeared with impunity The Pakistani government's inaction and failure to address these disappearances have led to increasing frustration and distrust among affected communities While Pakistan frequently positions itself as an advocate for the rights of Kashmiris on the international stage, its actions in Pakistan occupy Jammu and Kashmir paint a different picture. Reports of widespread human rights abuses in POJK and Gilgit Baltistan continue to surface as Pakistani authorities clamp down on dissent, stifle free speech and neglect the basic rights of the region's residents. Let's delve into the growing crisis in this region where the repression has become a daily reality for thousands of Kashmiris. Pakistan has consistently portrayed itself as a defender of Kashmiri rights, raising the issue of Kashmir at platforms like the United Nations. This has helped Pakistan garner international sympathy for what it calls the plight of Kashmiris. But when it comes to Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir the narrative shifts Human rights organizations have repeatedly accused Pakistan's military and intelligence agencies of severe human rights violations in POJK These include arbitrary arrests torture and targeting of activists who challenge the government's control or military presence in the region Recently, Zamil Maksud, president of the Foreign Affairs Committee for the United Kashmir People's National Party, expressed deep concerns about the ongoing violations in Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir. He highlighted how activists participating in peaceful protests are systematically targeted by the Pakistani authorities. Pakistan is targeting all those who have vehemently participated in the long march to reduce electricity bill and to revive all the subsidies which were uh, given before so it is a flower uh, subsidy it was sub subsidy on electricity bills and on many other uh, essentials uh, that was uh, that was uh, dismantled or taken away by the last government of uh, pakistan so uh, now uh, especially the student organizations the the young political stalwarts uh have been abducted have been tortured in zafarabad in bagh in ravalakot and in uh, other areas and the case of uh, uh, miss asma batul ali shamrez and raja madassars are one of them uh, so approximately uh, 300 people who were the activists and who who were previously have been working with the intelligence agencies are um, disappeared and there is there is no data available of all these disappearances and uh, uh, torture detention illegal confinement etc so at this moment the situation of human rights in in these areas uh, is very bleak and we we demand 
uh, international institutions as well as human rights organization to take serious cognizance of this uh, unfortunate situation which our people are going through right now. Life in Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir is marked by fear and intimidation. Peaceful protests are frequently met with brutal crackdowns by security forces. Protest leaders and demonstrators are often detained without due process and those who demand political autonomy or independence from Pakistan pay severe charges of sedition or treason. Many have disappeared without a trace. The media too has been silenced in the region. Local journalists face constant threats and media censorship has escalated in recent years. Reporters are forced to adhere to the state's narrative and those who attempt to expose the truth risk being harassed or detained. Independent coverage of the situation is nearly impossible with security forces closely monitoring media activities. In POJK, uh, basically it is worse than the other areas because uh, there are human rights organizations functioning in, in, in the provinces or in other areas but not in uh, POJK. There is no credible organization or credible media organization which is uh, uh, functioning in uh, POJK and Galgit Baltistan. That's why uh, the outer world uh, have uh, not been informed about uh, constant violation of human rights since decades. Uh, there is no uh, national or electronic media presented in Gilgit Baltistan or also in uh, in various areas of uh, Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir. So because of non-availability of uh, uh, current uh, information, current news, um, we collect all this information through our friends, through our uh, comrades, through our party uh, comrades in, in various areas. This situation is compounded by the region's economic deprivation. Many areas in POJK remain severely underdeveloped, lacking essential infrastructure such as schools, hospitals and proper roads. Residents claim that Pakistan's government has not invested in the region's development but has instead exploited its resources leaving the local population frustrated and feeling like second-class citizens in their own land. Human rights groups have called on the international community to take urgent action. They argue that Pakistan's control over POJK has only increased the suffering of its people with little concern for their rights or well-being. Activists are demanding independent investigations into the abuses and greater international pressure on Pakistan to ensure the protection of the region's residents. In yet another disturbing development, terrorists targeted security forces in Jammu's Rajori district escalating violence in a region that has remained largely peaceful for years. The recent attacks are part of a larger shift in Pakistan-backed terrorism, with terror groups now focusing on destabilizing Jammu. Experts warn that these coordinated strikes signal a deliberate attempt to spread unrest across the region. We bring you an in-depth report. On September 4, Unidentified terrorists opened fire at a Jammu and Kashmir police team in the Thanamandi area of Rajori district. Both the Indian Army and police forces swiftly launched a massive cordon and search operation to track down the attackers. Additional security forces have been deployed to the region and the situation is under close monitoring. For months now, experts have noted an unsettling pattern. Pakistan's deep state is actively attempting to shift terror operations from Kashmir to Jammu. Areas extending from Punch to Kathua, particularly the mountainous Pir Panjal and Kishtwar ranges, have become new hotspots for terrorist activities. The intent behind these terror strikes is clear, to destabilize the Jammu region and incite violence in a zone 
that has been relatively peaceful for decades. Pakistan is desperate. We had conducted the G20 successfully. The Lok Sabha elections have been conducted successfully with the largest ever strength that went to polls. There is going to be assembly election soon. Pakistan does not want to spread fear and is now targeting the security forces. Except for the Riyasi attack where nine civilians got killed when they attacked the bus. Otherwise, all the attacks that have been taken, encounters that have taken place in the last 15-20 days have been against the security forces. Obviously, there is a shift in strategy of Pakistan. India too needs to shift its strategy into an offensive defence strategy. Within the valley, we got to recreate our security grid and the intelligence grid as far as Jammu region is concerned and also eliminate not only the terrorists but all the supporters of theirs in terms of overground workers. The modus operandi of these Pakistani-backed terror groups is familiar, using local overground workers for logistical support and exploiting well-hidden hideouts across the region. The recent terror attacks in Katwa, Doda and Riyasi bear an eerie resemblance to the terror-stricken districts of South Kashmir, signaling a deliberate move by Pakistan to extend its terror network into Jammu. The surge in coordinated attacks points to a larger strategic intent, one that seeks to spread terror and fear among the local population, while undermining India's efforts to restore peace in Jammu and Kashmir. Since mid-2021, at least 26 terror attacks have occurred in the Jammu division, according to the South Asian Terrorism Portal. This marks a clear effort to revive militancy in Jammu, especially after the scrapping of Jammu and Kashmir's special status in 2019. I am quite certain that they have got adequate internal support from elements within that, within that area. So there are some villagers or some other people who are providing them the intelligence and the local support. That much is evident. Uh, simply eliminating the terrorists or these Pakistanis uh, military people who have come in is not going to be the answer. I think we require much sterner measures. And uh, in my view, as a start, simply as a start, we know where the general routes of infiltration where these people have come from, either in the Doda sector or in Katua or wherever else they have come from. We know those areas that they have come from there. And it is quite evident that if they have come from those areas, they have been supported by the Pakistani military posts which are located alongside. I think it is time for us to destroy each and every post which has carried out these activities. Despite India's relentless counter-terrorism efforts, peace in Jammu and Kashmir remains fragile. Pakistan continues to harbour and support terror groups like lashkar e taiba and jaish e muhammad using its intelligence agency ISI to nurture and promote anti-India forces. These terror outfits backed by Pakistan remain committed to destabilising the region, keeping the cycle of violence alive. In response to the recent attacks, large-scale search operations are ongoing with senior police and army officers personally overseeing the efforts. The battle against terrorism is far from over, but India's security forces are determined to counter every move made by Pakistan's terror machinery. In the face of relentless oppression, Afghan women are rising against the Taliban's brutal regime. Their acts of defiance are reverberating across the globe, challenging a regime intent on silencing them. Afghan women, defined in the face of the Taliban's oppressive regime, are using social media to broadcast their resistance through powerful revolutionary songs and messages. Despite the Taliban's harsh new laws restricting women's freedom, including bans on singing and public speaking, Afghan women remain undeterred. A report. Afghan women, both inside and outside the country, are turning to social media to voice their resistance against the Taliban's draconian laws. Through revolutionary songs, they are defying the Taliban's attempts to stifle their voices. Zadito amresoni mohre khomushi dahanam ro 
One song poignantly asks, Will you seal the silence of my mouth until the second order? A direct challenge to the oppressive regime's anticipated future decrees. These acts of resistance highlight the ongoing struggle against the Taliban's repressive regime. بیا دیوارها را در نویسم و جای ضعف خود باور نویسم بگیر دستم بده دستت که با هم کتاب سر نوشت از سر نویسم هیچ قدرتی نمیتواند صدا و تصویر زنان را حذف بکند ما با همین صداها بر علیه نابرابری ایستادگی خواهیم کرد و شکست, ح... شکست شما را حتمی خواهیم ساخت in a sweeping move to tighten its grip on Afghan society, Taliban's supreme leader, Hibatullah Akhundzada, has ordered officials to enforce a harsh new morality law aimed at further curtailing women's rights. The recently published 35 article decree mandates severe restrictions, including a ban on women singing reading aloud in public or letting their voices be heard outside their homes. This oppressive law not only strips women of their basic rights but also serves to enforce the Taliban's austere vision of Islamic society. The new laws also force women to wear thick clothes that completely cover their bodies, including their faces, while in public and bans them from looking directly at men they are not related to by blood or marriage. Those who fail to comply with the restrictions can be detained and punished in a manner deemed appropriate by Taliban officials. خب در طول این مدت که سه سال طالبان آمدی به افغانستان و حاکم شدین برنامه های زیادی برای حضب زنان داشتین از شروع او از شروع مقاطع که برای خانم ها مقاطع ببسته کردن و همچنان هم تو دانشگاه ها و با مرور زمان کار از پیشتن گرفتن اکنون فشار هایی که جهان بر سر اینا میاره و یا رسمیت به اینا نمیده یا تامل با اینا نمیکنه این ها همه فشار ها را بر سر زنان میارن میتونن از این برنامه ها و از این فشار ها با استفاده از زن ها این برنامه ها را کاملا تطبیق بکنن در کشور و سودش از جهان بگیرن The Taliban's reign has seen a steady erosion of women's rights since they regained power in 2021 Women and girls have been systematically excluded from education banned from nearly all forms of paid employment and prohibited from accessing public spaces like parks and gyms. Earlier this year, the Taliban even announced the reinstatement of stoning as a punishment for adultery, a chilling reminder of their brutal past. The shocking level of oppression of Afghan women and girls is immeasurably cruel. The international community has responded with strong condemnation, refusing to recognize the Taliban as Afghanistan's legitimate government. The United Nations has been clear recognition will not be considered as long as the Taliban's ban on female education and employment remain in place. Despite this, the Taliban dismisses global criticism as unwelcome interference leaving Afghanistan's future hanging in the balance. از این منابعی که طالبان را میتونه پربی بکنه جلوگیری بکنه اونا رو دعوت نکنه و اونا پول گذار توان نکنه و بیشتر با مردم تعامل بکنه و ببینه که حقیقت طالب چی هست As the world watches, Afghan women continue to resist, determined to reclaim their rights and their future. The fight against the Taliban's repressive regime is far from over and these brave women are at the forefront, refusing to be silenced. And with that, 
We come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Pratiksha Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.